and it takes and it takes and it takes and we keep living anyway. We rise and we fall and we break and we make our mistakes. And if there's a reason I'm still alive when so many who loved me have died, I'm willing to wait for it. I couldn't stop listening to that song this week. I saw a few hints of recognition. I think Jane especially is familiar with that song. It is of course, a song from the musical Hamilton entitled, Wait For It. And I think it's one of the most powerful numbers in the show. Who's seen it? Can you, can you give me a show of hands? I, I wanna know who's, who's maybe seen it or heard it before. The past few days, I just couldn't stop listening to the song. I had it on repeat, playing it again and again and again. There was just something about it that compelled me. I don't know if that ever happens to you, where you just get that song stuck in your head, stuck in your heart, and you just can't stop listening to it. There was something that felt fitting to this moment, to this sermon. Wait For It is sung by the character Aaron Burr, who, spoiler alert, is the one who eventually kills Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Burr is objectively the villain of the story. He's the counterpart to the hero that is Hamilton. And yet, if you've seen the musical, as many of you have, you know that he is portrayed as so fully complicated and human. He's a complex character. You can see his ambition, his love, his intellect, as well as his jealousy and his anger. Not everyone is a musical theater fan, and I get to that. <laughs> I have many friends who, if they knew I were preaching about a musical this morning, would roll their eyes and say, Sarah, again, come on. But for me, for me, there is something profound about how the actors and the movement and the music of this format of art can capture the human experience. And if you've seen the actor Leslie Odom Jr. perform this song, perhaps you can understand a bit of why I couldn't stop listening to it this week. Loss, confusion, grit, and resilience, they're all written on his face in just this three minute song. And in his performance, which I went back and watched several times, I saw a reflection of my own emotional state. I think this song speaks to the grief and anxiety and anger that's taken up residence in my body. It seems to live right below my lower ribs, close to the surface. It's been a regular visitor since the spring, showing up as I've experienced the death of a coworker, as I've watched COVID numbers rise, as I've joined protests in the street, As I sat listening to this song, sitting with that feeling in my body, I remembered a profile of Leslie Odom Jr. that I read four years ago, around the time when he was nominated for a Tony Award for his performance in Hamilton. Some people have the Super Bowl, I have the Tony Awards. And the piece detailed how hard he fought for the role of Aaron Burr. Leslie had just about given up on ever making it to Broadway. He was beginning to think that his career as an actor would never happen when he got this invitation to do an informal workshop of the show. And he pursued the part relentlessly. He dressed to the nines. He memorized the lines for that reading. He texted the director 
telling him again and again how much he wanted to be a part of this show. He put all his cards on the table. And it worked. He not only starred in the role of Aaron Burr, he won that Tony Award. And in my wormhole of Hamilton this week, I actually rewatched his acceptance speech, which moved me in its own way. Sometimes when I'm preparing a sermon, I just have to trust that the spirit is leading me to something. And so I rewatched his acceptance speech. And in it, he thanked his community saying, you are extraordinary in every way. Don't ever let anyone tell you different. You are limitless, boundless. I thank you for the fidelity of your friendship. I almost didn't make it here. I almost fell. And everywhere I looked, there was a Renee, there was a Philippa, there was a David, and he says as many names as he can before that award show music starts to cut him off and signal that he needs to exit. He gets through as many names as he can. And I sat with that. I sat with both the words of this song and the words of his speech. And I felt this deep resonance because we all almost didn't make it here in a way, right? Sometimes I sit on these Sunday mornings and I think it is a wonder that we have made it here at all in these bodies, in these relationships, on this Zoom call. I mean, take a quick look side to side, up and down Brady Bunch style. It is a wonder that we have come to be here together in the midst of a life where we rise and fall and break and make our mistakes, we've all come to be in this moment. And we all had people who got us here, right? People who helped us, who taught us, who shaped us, healed us, loved us. Today's All Saints Day a day for naming and honoring those very people. It's actually part of this trio of days from all hallows to all souls tomorrow. These days are set aside to remember those who have influenced our lives and our faith. It's a somber day, yes. It acknowledges the painful human realities of death, and of grief, but it's also a day where we as Christians affirm that death is not the end. And we remind ourselves of the powerful spiritual bond that exists between heaven and earth. Our text from Hebrews speaks to that bond. The author you see is writing to a community that's facing extreme hardship. And the question at the heart of the text is, how do we endure difficulty? How do we endure difficulty? It's an apt question for any time, but especially now, right? How do we persevere when there is so much, too much loss and anxiety and grief? Now, thankfully, this text not only poses the question, but provides an answer, it makes my job as a preacher a little easier. And the answer that the text provides is faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's an oft quoted verse, one which can run the risk of sounding like a trite platitude, but these words are actually an invitation into the majesty and mystery of God. If you dig into the Greek of this verse, you'll find that the author is giving a two-part definition for faith. Faith is both a promise and an action. 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Another way to translate this might be faith is the confidence of things hoped for. Faith is the foundation of things hoped for. Faith is the ultimate promise from God that our life matters on this earth, that we are loved, that we are saved, that death isn't the end. It's a promise that God is always with us. And faith is the conviction of things not seen. This could also be translated as the evidence of things not seen, the proof of things not seen. Faith is both a promise and our active experience of God. It can sound a bit confusing because we can't see God directly. And yet, I'm sure we all have experiences of God. We've all had moments that have pointed to, to something. We've all had people who have shown God to us, many of whom are the very people we are remembering on this All Saints Day. How do we get through the difficult times? By faith, by remembering the promise of God and by recounting the ways that God has been active in our lives. Faith has this power to make God present now. Faith says that God isn't just waiting in the wings somewhere. God is here right now in this moment in the midst of our grief and confusion and anxiety and whatever it is that you have living in that place right below your ribs. Foster read the beginning of Hebrews 11 and then I had him jump to the beginning of Hebrews 12. Again, in oft quoted verse, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Oh, it's a beautiful verse. It's one of my favorites. And here the author of Hebrews is telling us another way to get through difficult times. We didn't get just one answer, we get multiple by faith and by drawing on our great cloud of witnesses. Now I'm not a runner. I get really horrible shin splints. I do not like it, I will not do it. So I've always had a bit of trouble relating to this idea of the race, but I do love the Chicago Marathon. I love to be a spectator of the Chicago Marathon. I love to go every year and I watch it and I just weep. It's a similar feeling I get to the Olympics because it's just this tremendous force of positive energy. People are out with their signs and their cowbells and their glitter, cheering on loved ones and strangers alike as they do something that to me seems Herculean. When we come together in that crowd, I don't know how many of you watch the marathon, but when we come together, there's a sense that we're collectively assisting the marathoners in their task, propelling them forward with this sheer force of our goodwill. That's the cloud of witnesses. People who are no longer physically present, but <clears throat> who are cheering us on, affirming us, running alongside us to help us keep the pace. How do we persevere in moments of difficulty? Hebrews 11 tells us by faith. Hebrews 12 tells us by calling on our great cloud of witnesses, but there is one other important piece. And it's the scripture that knits together Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12. And between these two sections is a litany of our faithful ancestors. I've actually been reading Hebrews recently as my own personal reflection, and I found this so moving. I encourage you to go read it later today. It's this litany that the author writes of the faith of Abel and the faith of Noah, the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses, the faith of Joseph, the faith of David, all the way up to Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. The author goes through this ritual act of naming the ancestors. 
naming those who are no longer with the community. And in doing so, shows them and shows us all these centuries removed that we are not alone. The author helps us picture just how far our faith has brought us. The faith of our ancestors, the faith of Abraham and Moses, and also Sarah and Miriam and Esther and Ruth and Mary and Elizabeth. Can you picture it? Can you picture the people in your life, in our lives who have shown God to us? The people who have formed you, your personal saints. The faith of Della, the faith of Alvin, the faith of Randy, our cloud of witnesses. People who knew of God's promise and who also were evidence of God's love to us. They are here. They are here today. Let's name them together. And in doing so, invoke this bond between heaven and earth that reminds us we are not alone. We're going to show a slideshow of some of this cloud of witnesses. But if you weren't able for any reason to get that name for the slideshow, I invite you to put it in the chat. If you're on Facebook, you can put it in the comments and I will name them. Elikum, will you play a little music for us as we enter that time together? and Vandermulen.
these saints. Those who have passed this year, those who have been such a part of our lives and our faith, help us to feel the cloud of witnesses close to us on this day and in all the days to come as we run with perseverance the journey that has been set before us. We're going to 